Our next speaker is Alexei Voynov. We'll be talking about low carbon um, and climate mitigation. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation. And thanks for the opportunity to uh, talk to you, though. Uh, you would probably, it would be hard to place the two talks, uh, to, 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 to choose the two talks which would be more different th 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 than the ones that you're going to be listening. So uh, basically, you need to really switch gears to, to, to for, from let's say, real science to some kind of hand-waving that I'll be doing. Uh, uh, I've been associated with uh, CSDMS systems for quite some time, probably more than a decade, and it's really impressive how uh, the whole uh, program evolved. And apparently, at the moment, we are also uh, at the stage when at least there is some consideration of the humans in landscapes and in these geomorphic forms. And uh, probably that's one of the reasons why I'm here talking to you about uh, uh, something that we're doing right now in this project. And though myself, uh, by training computer scientists, uh, working a lot in environmental modeling, doing some uh, watershed modeling, in the past, uh, then gradually evolving more and more towards the human uh, aspects through stakeholder involvement and then eventually to economics. And I'll try to explain some of the reasons that drives me in this direction and that makes it kind of interesting for me to uh, explore uh, these uh, issues. Um, well, first of all, this is something that really bothers me, honestly. So we're, we're at a period of time when something I call the triple whammy of today, when we have these three kind of components uh, that are uh, interacting quite uh, heavily. And let me try to show you what I mean. So we've got climate change. Uh, as a result of climate change, we're expecting some increased variability in floods and droughts and hurricanes and all that kind of nasty things coming, which you are well aware of. But if you start to somehow extend this chain of uh, events, what you also realize is that, well, we need to somehow prepare for that, if not uh, avoid it, uh, which means that we need some more energy to do that. So we need to build more dams, we need to build uh, more levees, and uh, there's more energy required for that. At the same time, what happens is that we're running out of cheap energy, and let's face it, the energy that we're extracting today uh, costs us 10 times more than what we uh, extracted uh, 60 years ago, which means that the efficiency of the fossil uh, system that we are largely uh, based on is uh, declining. So uh, immediately we also see some kind of a feedback effect because in fact uh, the burning of these fossil fuels is what's driving climate change. So whenever we have these kind of positive feedbacks, that's already something that makes you worry. So uh, indeed, one of the things we're looking for to avoid the peak energy would be uh, alternative energy. So let's uh, find something else. Uh, the nasty thing for that is that in order to do that, we also need to build new infrastructure. So another positive feedback, so basically alternative energy doesn't come from free. We don't have the infrastructure, we have to build it, we have to develop it. And uh, th these things also require more energy. Uh, and the uh, uh, other kind of thing is that all this is happening globally. So whereas before, we had these kind of problems on more or less localized, the Maya civilization and the different empires that have collapsed in the past were more or less uh, local. Now everything is really globalized. So that's what really drives my interest in this and uh, something is going to happen, let's face it. So the only kind of issue is when and, and to what extent we can uh, avoid it. The interesting thing is that we actually know uh, what we have to do, uh, except we don't do it because this involves changes in human behavior and we hate that. Uh, 
we see the past history of uh, climate mitigation, and we see that even up till now, uh, well, first of all, climate change is not real. We don't want to believe in it in some countries especially. Uh, and then uh, the result is that, well, actually the trends are more or less the same, uh, per capita more or less uh, the same. So even though we know that something is wrong, we're not really doing much about it. So the question is why is this and how maybe we as uh, scientists, uh, the real scientists and not the social scientists, and, and I, I, I'm saying this not because I think so, but it's just the kind of sentiment that I hear very often, even in the university that, that I work with, uh, that, that there is a big difference. I think that's actually wrong. Uh, but but, but uh, let's try to apply some of our thinking and in, to analyze some of the models that, that, that the... Uh, 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 social scientists are using and immediately you find that well there's a lot of problems with the economic models that are used today well first of all they still assume that we have abundant uh, natural resources uh, secondly uh, as a result they uh, really are based on demand so uh, whenever you're looking at the uh, models uh, for the future uh, economic development uh, it's the demand that, that, that drives supply. The assumption is that if there is demand, there will be supply. And that's definitely wrong. Uh, it uses some uh, absolutely ridiculous assumptions about what are the goals of the whole economic system. Uh, even still now, everybody's talking about how economic growth is great and how this is something that has to be maintained and developed uh, on a limited planet. Well, give me a break. Uh, it uses some absolutely crazy indicators, such as like, such, such as GDP. Again, assuming that this is actually an indicator of, of our uh, welfare, uh, of our um, well-being, which is totally wrong. Uh, and there is a lot of uh, explanations and, and examples why this is wrong. Uh, most of the economic models are actually operating at the margin. They're, they don't uh, really expect any dramatic, any system change, any structural change. They assume that the whole system adapts and uh, evolves uh, by uh, accommodating some of the changes in the, uh, the world that we are looking at. Uh, no structural change, and also they are spatially uniform. Either they're global or they're local. There's probably uh, very little models that I know which actually link the different uh, spatial and temporal scales. Uh, they also use very simple assumptions about uh, human behavior. So uh, rationality and homogeneity uh, is uh, the, some of the basic ideas about what uh, economic systems are uh, about. And uh, obviously no uh, account for social learning and the fact that people are actually adapting somehow to what's going on. Uh, this is a European funded project that I'm part of at the moment where in a way we're trying to apply some of the knowledge that we have uh, gained from also uh, natural systems modeling to uh, probably uh, try to improve some of the economic models that are uh, available. So it's a joint effort uh, between economists, economists and uh, social scientists and natural sciences where we have this kind of model zoo at, at the moment where uh, a mix of uh, open source and proprietary models which describe uh, all sorts of uh, systems uh, including um, also a whole suite of different modeling paradigms, uh, starting with integrated assessment, uh, hydrology models, land use models, uh, some of the uh, agent-based models, uh, computer global equilibrium models, uh, simply data, and some of uh, the conceptual models that come from uh, stakeholder interaction. So what we're trying to do is to make some sense 
between these models, and in particular a uh, work package on model integration, is designed to try to understand how these different models talk to each other, uh, how they can actually uh, provide information from one model into another. Kind of sounds similar to what we've heard about the other types of models that uh, systems uh, is uh, about, uh, except that uh, one major difference that we're running into, and, and in fact a complication, is that we're dealing with models that are run by very different paradigms. So uh, connecting, for instance, an agent-based model with a computer global equilibrium model is a problem by itself. Uh, integrated modeling is what we're all so much fascinated about, and uh, there are some problems which when you're doing this kind of transdisciplinary modeling are only aggravated. We've seen this before in the models that we've been developing uh, with uh, the uh, natural kind of side of, of, the, of the story. Here things become uh, even further uh, complicated. Pretty much the same list of software issues that we run into systems. In fact, this is from Scott's uh, paper where uh, these issues are very well described and pretty much what CSDMS has been doing over these years is gradually trying to sort out some of these uh, issues with a variety, uh, ver ver varying level of success, but these things are uh, being fixed. From the modeling angle, we still see some problems. So uh, first of all, what we realize, and this is actually something that comes very nicely once you start discussing these models with the stakeholders and with the users, something that uh, is in a way addressed with the EKT uh, efforts, but still a long way to go in terms of delivery of these results, visualizing these results, e explaining how the different uh, terms and assumptions used in conceptual modeling, for instance, can be translated and transferred into numerical quantitative models, and vice versa, how do we actually visualize our results to bring them back to the stakeholders and make them uh, understand them. Uh, to what extent actually modeling is art and to what extent it's science is, 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 is still a big question and uh, in fact something that I kind of like to illustrate with these artistic metaphors, uh, I, I, I think I've shown it already too, too many times but I still think it's a great illustration of what might be actually happening when we put models together without sufficient uh, reasoning and thought uh, put in place. A nice, uh, supposedly, way to integrate two models. We have one component that is coupled with another component, and the result, at least to most people, seems to be visually appealing. If we use more or less the same rules, and if we do another type of integration, we will get something like this, <laughs> called collective invention by Magritte. Uh, the rules are the same. Uh, yet the result does not seem to be as visually at least appealing as the previous one. So I suggest we call these kind of integronsters. So that's what comes from integrating pieces without putting enough thought about how we actually do that. Another simple example, we, in, in, in geometry we can also run into pretty nasty uh, constructs if we take a geometrically perfectly well-designed uh, picture of a Belvedere, uh, we can have another one which is also geometrically perfectly uh, well arranged. Everything is in place, all columns, all, everything makes sense. And then if we try to put them together, again, following very simple rules, a column is a column. We connect columns to each other. And suddenly we realize that we start climbing a ladder from inside and we end up in the outside. And something is totally twisted curvy here. And that's a problem. Again, we applied the rules, we got results which were not necessarily uh, what we uh, expected to see. So also what comes with 
piling models one on top of another as this complexity cur uh, occurs. Uh, it's harder to communicate, it's harder to explain them, it's harder to get stakeholders uh, actually uh, use them appropriately. And this is something that uh, constantly uh, comes to uh, the, the, the stage when we start communicating these models uh, to the uh, decision makers and to the, the policy makers. Uh, another alternative which has been also developing and some, and, and some of the models that we're dealing with in, in complex are so-called integral models. Again, that, that's the terminology that is suggested to use when actually a model is used to develop the whole system, but from a certain angle. So you can uh, build a regional model for, from, from the point of view of its uh, ecology, from the point of view of its business, for instance. And then basically you're talking about knowledge integration. So what kind of knowledge comes from one type of model of the whole and another model of the whole, and how can you actually then put these things together? Uh, the artistic metaphor that comes to mind when you are dealing with these sorts of models is another kind of Chinese uh, uh, parable about the uh, elephant that is being explored by uh, six uh, blind people coming from different sides of it. So one touches the uh, trunk and thinks that it's a snake, uh, the one who touches the tail thinks it's a rope, and so on. You know the story. So uh, again, it's not really clear how do you communicate uh, these models, and what's even more important and what's more difficult is to connect these models with the other type of models, or the other qu quantitative types of models that, 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 that we use, which are more uh, sector-based, disciplinarily based. So uh, at the moment, this is the kind of first cut of models that we're dealing with and that we're trying to connect. Uh, the agent-based, uh, for instance, model is supposed to be using the CGE model uh, f for uh, updating the state of these agents uh, on different local or uh, regional uh, levels. There is the system dynamics model, which is a kind of an integral model. And again, what we want to do is to compare, for instance, the results that come from here to what can be extracted from uh, this uh, other uh, in integrated uh, effort. In any case, uh, the, 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 the technological imperative seems to be quite simple, uh, quite similar to, to, to what uh, systems has been uh, dealing with over uh, these years. In a way, we're trying to make these models less of an art and more of a uh, science, more of a software tool, which then allows us to uh, adopt and use some of the computer artificial intelligence uh, approaches to uh, actually sort through the different uh, features and, 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 and uh, different uh, options we have with these models using ontology, uh, engineering, metadata. Uh, the, the development of standards is, is an extremely important uh, s uh, step that we're very much involved in at the moment. Uh, so for example, I don't know if it's a good term, it's still under discussion, we call it a meta model. Uh, I know it's an overloaded term, but if we have metadata, which are data about data, I thought that meta model is also kind of a model of a model, so why not? Uh, what we're talking about here is uh, a hierarchy of, of different standards that can be used to describe these models uh, with uh, the goal of, of uh, facilitating a whole series of, 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 of different uses and, and uh, applications, including model integration and interfacing these models with each other and the stakeholders. Uh, the, the, the real trick in this case, and something that again Scott is very well aware of, is the fact that we need to communicate assumptions that are in these models, and that's the tricky part of this. And uh, the challenges are, first of all, uh, the buy-in and acceptance of the modeling community into this process. But hopefully something that still can be done. 
the model integration that we are following at the moment is uh, still very much based on loose coupling. We assume uh, we, we're going to be using web services for wrapping the different uh, models. Uh, we intend to uh, apply some of the semantic integration based on the model documents and the ontologies that are available. Uh, so the uh, service-oriented architecture will use the uh, uh, web services as wrappers to connect uh, these uh, models together. Semantic mediation for different uh, types of uh, calling conventions that hopefully we can also uh, resolve with better documentation about the uh, models. And then we get back to the social kind of imperative. So first of all, yes, we want these models to be open source, which is not the case in our uh, project when uh, about a quarter of them are proprietary. What do we do with them? So how do we convince these people that actually it would be better even for them if these things become open source? So far, it's still a challenge. So this is a kind of a social process of integration of, of, of scientists, if you may. Uh, modeling with stakeholders and integrating stakeholders into the process. Uh, how do we actually allow the people to understand what these models in? And uh, how do we develop the uh, toolboxes for participatory modeling. So uh, participatory modeling seems to be a very powerful tool to integrate uh, the users and the stakeholders into the process. But there's still very big distance between the complicated quantitative excellent tools that we've got and the actual visualizations and the buy-in of these results by the stakeholders. How do we bring in conceptual models that come out of these workshops when people are drawing diagrams and discussing how things work and how they are connected? Uh, is there any way that we can actually bring some of the quantitative uh, dimension into this discussion and, and uh, add to, to, to what they are discussing uh, during these meetings? Uh, visualization really is uh, paramount for uh, this uh, process. And uh, we do need to learn how this is done in, in, in the business and advertisement uh, sector. They know very well how to sell their uh, results and, and their issues. So the, the, the need is really to put the user up front and go out there and communicate with them. We are very much embedded into this kind of linear scheme of model development when we start with defining the model process, specifying the modeling content, going through all these steps of putting together the best algorithms, programming them, running them, identifying the parameters, calibrating for these parameters, running these verifications, quantifying uncertainty, and then cranking out results. And now the assumption is that everybody is there waiting for our results, but the reality is that they're not. They really don't care about these results. I put together this kind of uh, little um, animation to try to explain this point. And, 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 and what seems to be happening is that we've got this kind of big, little, big complex world out there. Uh, and uh, we're sitting in front of our computer, very much on top of this ivory tower, looking at what's happening in this world and assuming that somebody is telling us what to do and what kind of uh, decisions, uh, what kind of solutions we have to provide. Uh, and then we provide, the, 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 the reality is that these goals for these uh, modeling efforts are, are very often coming from the ideal, ideal world, not the real world. Uh, the results that we produce are then sent back to this world, but then they end up actually in the you do realize that this is Bosque's, uh, this is the paradise, the world, and the hell, right? So that's where they end up, and we end up as a result. Uh, so basically what we're trying probably to do is try to get out of this uh, ivory tower and get inside this and actually be part of this process of formulating the goals of our models, formulating uh, the tasks for us to do, and then, oops, and then, oh, no, you don't want to look through this whole thing again. 
somehow the last part got missing. So you want to really get inside and continue working with the world. Uh, we published this little paper where we actually tried to come up with some of these uh, commandments for uh, modeling, which starts with the idea, uh, with, with, with the notion that we really want to stop pretending that applied science is, is value neutral. And I kind of put applied in bold because I know that in this audience there's a lot of non-applied scientists and for them the science is value neutral like for instance the, the, the gravity on Mars is probably really independent of values but as soon as you start applying these things to like what David was telling us about earlier today about uh, digging for oil uh, then values become important what we actually put into our models and how we deal with this uh, becomes uh, a part of our uh, de decision. Uh, we actually need to communicate these values and, 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 and it, it is important for the integration process to uh, involve these stakeholders into this process. We need to really engage with them to define the problems together on the, on the receiving end and we also want to engage with the policymakers to actually make sure that what we're doing is uh, uh, taken up and, and, and used uh, for uh, action. And uh, we do want to try to turn around the weapons. So far, the advertising industry is actually driving us. And uh, I think this should really, we think it should really change because unless we are learning to communicate our results in a vivid and uh, powerful way, uh, we, we're not uh, producing the action that is so much needed. So something that comes out of the stakeholder process where you have a much more complex interaction between different stages of the modeling and you constantly go through these stages including the conceptual models that are also part of this integration uh, is, uh, is kind of promising in, in this context. So the real challenge is, yeah actually just when, when we were finishing this, this, this paper uh, this article came in, uh, in, in in Guardian which was uh, very nice to, 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 to see that it's not just us thinking that actually scientists have to do something now. So just quickly to conclude, I think it's really important that we start thinking just beyond the discipline that we are in. And uh, trust me, it's actually a lot of fun. You do find a lot of interesting things coming from other disciplines uh, that, that, that people are, are, are doing. Uh, the uh, Integral models may actually be sometimes more useful than, than integrated ones. They are actually sometimes easier to control their complexity because that's where you really choose the important things on the model uh, development uh, stage. Uh, the, the real issue is how do you scale this complexity and how do you uh, continuously move from a simple model to a more complicated model as more data and more needs uh, evolve. The, the temporal and spatial scales, we had an interesting discussion today in, in the Anthropocene group where we immediately realized that even the definition of an Anthropocene is very much dependent upon the temporal and the spatial scale that we assume. What is it in, 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 in Anthropocene? Uh, and whether this is even a proper name for this uh, group. Uh, what, how do we deal with the complexity that comes out of these models? It's becoming only more difficult to communicate these models. And uh, again, integration of knowledge, conceptual mental models of stakeholders with the quantitative tools that we have at hand uh, becomes really a challenge when you're dealing with these transdisciplinary uh, types of uh, research that I've been uh, referring to. Thank you. the difference between integral models and integrated models. One more time, please. 
Um, okay. The, 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 the the, the, the difference is the, the, that integral model, a perfect example would be World 3 by Meadows. You know that one? So basically, you're developing a model of the system as a whole. It contains information from a lot of different disciplines in it. But this information is put together at the stage of putting the model together. It's not uh, a result of integrating components that come from other people developing these tools before. We and, and many others have found that uh, in the uh, pedagogical uh, treatment of, of some of these complex families of equations, the best way to get across much of the teaching is to make experiential education part of it. And I wonder if that's something that you can see used in the stakeholder group. That is, the model should have an ability for individuals to gain intuition by uh, experimenting and finding things that are new with them and making that part of the, uh, uh, of the exchange process. Uh, absolutely. It, it goes e even beyond that. What, what we found with these stakeholder processes that actually helps people understand and buy in into the model is their participation in the model design. So what we do in participatory modeling, even though we have sometimes a pretty clear idea of our own what the system is and, and how it should be modeled, we start with these interactive discussions with the stakeholders when we ask them what they think the problem is. And then we guide them through this discussion, through the conceptual model, towards more or less the model that we have in mind, which also evolves from the input from them. So the visualization, the gaming part, and the playing with this model becomes obviously very important, but also the sense of them actually finding some of the ideas and concepts that they pr produced in the model turns out to be very powerful for them to understand what's happening and also to accept the model as a decision-making tool. Am I off the hook? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.